My guest today is Bill Exeter. Bill is the CEO of Exeter 1031 Exchange Services and Exeter Trust Company. He's built a career in real estate tax since 1986 with a focus on 1031 and 1033 exchanges, self-directed IRAs, title holding trusts, and custody accounts for alternative investments in real estate. He has administered over 125,000 1031 exchange transactions during his 31, uh, 37 year career uh, in the industry. And he's a co-founder of the Federation of Exchange Accommodators, an industry trade group. I invited Bill to the podcast today to share his insights and wisdom about 1031 exchanges for real estate investors. Bill, thanks so much for joining us today to talk about this important tax topic. My pleasure. Thank you for having us. I would love to start out just by learning a little bit about your background. Like, how did you decide to focus your career and business on this aspect of real estate? <laughs> uh, like many people, it's completely by accident. <laughs> So I was a controller of a bank up in Los Angeles and the chairman of the board decided to start a 1031 exchange qualified intermediary and outside counsel said, well, don't have the escrow subsidiary run it. We think that's a problem. So all of a sudden he threw it at me and I had no idea what a 1031 exchange was. Uh, and then about two months, maybe three months after that, UCLA had a two and a half day extension program specifically on 1031 exchange uh, processes and what have you. I uh, took that and that was in the mid 80s and my career did a kind of a left or a right turn there, depending on how you look at it. And here we are. So now I've been doing uh, 1031 exchanges and financial services, mostly in the trust area uh, ever since. Got it. Well, thank you for, for that background. And, um, you know, right now is like a very active real estate market. So I look forward to really getting your thoughts uh, on, on how to navigate a 1031. But just to level set, Many real estate investors understand, I think at least at a very high level, that a 1031 exchange is a legal mechanism afforded under Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code that allows you to sell real property that is used for business uh, or for buy and hold investment purposes. So, you know, not primary residence, not fix and flips, uh, and purchase like kind replacement property in a way that generally defers taxes and depreciation recapture from the first property and instead rolls the legacy tax basis into the second property so that you only deal with the cumulative tax consequences if you sell that second property at a future time. And you know if you don't, you can theoretically keep using 1031s on your investment real estate until you die, after which your heirs can take a step up in basis to fair market value, avoid all tax liability, uh, you know, subject, of course, to estate tax limits, which don't apply to most people. Um, so I think a lot of real estate investors kind of get this at a, just a very high level, but there's a lot of detail they may not know about how this all works. So I wanted to start off by first by asking, what are the key eligibility requirements for a transaction to qualify uh, for 1031 status? And what are the key steps to properly execute a 1031 transaction? Good question. That's that's probably the most important thing, a topic uh, with when you're talking about 1031 exchanges. Qualify. It's really bro it's, it's broken down into two uh, subtopics, if you will. The first one is qualified use. So the property they sell, the property they buy inside the same 1031 exchange have to be held for some type of rental, investment, or business use. And as long as it falls into one of those categories, it satisfies the qualified use test. Uh, but you also hit the nail on the head that if uh, someone is uh, you know, buying a property to, to rehab, fix up, and then sell or flip, they're really holding for sale. So that doesn't qualify. Uh, same if you are a developer, builder, contractor. Typically, you buy, build, and sell. You're holding for sale like inventory in your development business. So that doesn't qualify. Um, and if you're a condo conversion specialist, the same thing. You buy, you convert, and you sell. Now, if you did buy and then you rehab or develop or convert and then you hold as rental property, then you could do a 1031 exchange and it would qualify. So that qualified use, you know, a lot of people get hung up on how long have you held title to the property? Uh, did you hold it for at least a year, a year and a day or two years? It's important to note that those are opinions and that's all it is. Uh, the tax code, the regulations and the rulings have no holding period required. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, but, but so many investors get hung up on the timely. How long have you held title to the property? The real issue is, did you have the intent to hold for rental investment or business use? And if you can prove that, then the timing is not really an, uh, an issue. Of course, the longer you hold title, the easier it is to prove that it was held for rental or investment or business use. The shorter, um, you know, the less easy it is to prove intent. And then going back to the second subcategory, which is like kind, there is amazing how much misinformation uh, is out there. 
Uh, there's still curriculum that says if you sell a condo, you have to buy a condo. If you sell apartments, you have to buy apartments. And that's absolutely not true. Uh, like kind literally means you are selling real estate, you have to buy real estate. Simple as that. And people don't even realize what that could be. That would include things that are like air rights, water rights, mineral rights, oil and gas interests, et cetera. So anything that's considered real estate, for the most part under state law, would count. Got it. And there's, it sounds like there's no safe harbor for the, a duration requirement. It's, you're just purely proving intent and that is circumstantial. That, that's exactly right. Yep. There's no safe harbor whatsoever. Uh, you know, a lot of people say that if it's under one year, you don't qualify and that's not true. And I'll, I'll use an example for us. We had a client who sold, did an exchange, bought a condo, uh, didn't read the CCNRs. And just a few days after closing, he finally read them and realized uh, he couldn't rent. He had to, it had to be owner occupied. So of course he panicked and emailed and you know whatnot and sold immediately, did another 1031 exchange. Uh, he was audited by the California Franchise Tax Board and they actually allowed his 1031 exchange even though he was entitled for about a month and a half because he could clearly prove, especially with all those panicky emails that his intent was to hold for rental. Oh, that's an interesting example, got it. Okay, cool. So that, that kind of flushes that out. Um, I understand there are criteria that the replacement property must satisfy in terms of purchase price, equity rolled over, even mortgage amount in order to get the full tax deferral. Could you help us understand what those criteria are? Sure, and, and that's another area where there's a lot of misinformation out there. And what you'll see uh, in brochures and websites, et cetera, are statements like you must trade equal or up in value and you must replace your debt and you must reinvest your equity. And for the most part, that's true if you wanna defer all of your taxes, but it's a little misleading. So the two real requirements are that whatever you buy, whether it's one property or two or three properties, the total amount you buy, the aggregate, has to be equal or greater than what you sold. The second requirement is that all of the cash equity that comes out of the sale needs to be reinvested in your new properties that you acquire. You don't have to replace debt. Uh, you could replace the debt with out-of-pocket cash. So for example, if you sold the property for a million dollars and maybe it had 600,000 debt, 400,000 of equity, you could buy another replacement property for a million dollars and pay all cash and that would qualify because you've replaced the debt with cash. Uh, the issue is most of us don't have that kind of cash laying around, so you usually do have to replace debt. I see. Um, I, I may be mistaken about this. I, I was In my research, I was like kind of reading around um, the mortgage requirements. And I, I, I thought I read something around like um, if the mortgage value in the replacement property is less then the reduction in the mortgage amount is imputed to you as taxable gain. If that's incorrect, could you help me set the record straight? No, that's, uh, uh, it depends. So for example, uh, what some people will do is they'll, going back to the same example, they sell for a million, 600 debt, 400 equity, and maybe they go buy a new property and maybe they buy it for 900,000 and they put 400,000 equity in the new property and only get 500,000 of debt. So they've traded down by $100,000. So in that case, the, the real issue is they've traded down by 100,000. The net effect is they got a, a lower debt. So people call it mortgage boot and it's taxable. It's really that they just traded down in value. But if they you know, sold for a million, bought for a million and only got 500,000 of debt, that means they'd have to put in another $100,000 of cash out of pocket to replace that debt they didn't replace. But that one extra $100,000 would not be considered any gain of any kind? Correct, yep, that would be, it would all be tax deferred in that, in that uh, situation. Got it, so it sounds like the, the really key requirement is greater or equal value and you have to reinvest all your equity proceeds. But if you, let's say in your replacement property, you actually bought a more expensive property. You put even more cash in there. In fact, you put 100% cash. There's no debt. There's no tax consequences from that then in that, in that, in that case. Is that correct? Exactly. Yep. You can certainly do it all cash or, or anything you trade up by, you can certainly finance with more debt and that would also qualify. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, and so then I understand there's like this 45 day hard deadline. It is like not alterable except by the, the, the president of the United States for identifying a property. And then later there's 180 day deadline, both clocks start at the same time for actually closing a transaction. There's this property identification requirement for identifying like kind replacement property um, that I understand, you know, and just to briefly summarize for, for listeners, you have to either one, identify up to three, but no more than three re replacement candidates, or two, identify 
any number of replacement candidates so that so long as the total combined fair market value of them does not exceed 2x of the sale price of the property you're relinquishing, or three, identify any number of replacement candidates of any value, but then you're required to purchase 95% or more of the fair market value of all the replacement candidates combined. Mm -hmm. So uh, as an investor, it's not exactly intuitive like why these three tests exist. Like what's the purpose of it? Like what is the IRS trying to accomplish with these tests? Because if you successfully purchase a like kind replacement property, like what does it matter if you satisfy or didn't satisfy one of these three tests? Many of us have been wondering that same thing for 37 years. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, but in fact, many of us, there was about 55 that went back to testify uh, before the U.S. Treasury. And this is back in uh, 88, 89, just before the regulations came out and went final. And all of them testified against the 45 day period of the identification requirement and not one testified in favor of it. And it, they still put it in. So mm. kind of one of those things where you scratch your head and wonder what the heck, but it, it kind of, at this point it just is what it is. We have to make sure we comply with it. And I realized I didn't quite answer your first question thoroughly. So I thought I'd kind of combine it all with this one. Um, and that is the, a lot of investors don't realize you have to get the 1031 exchange set up before the sale closes or before any of the closings occur. Uh, the reason for that is whoever is listed in the documents as the seller has the right to the funds when the sale closes. So if you've set up the 1031 exchange and the qualified intermediary has been assigned into the transaction, then we have the right to receive the proceeds and that's what defers the taxes. Mm. If the 1031 exchange is not set up prior to and it closes, the client, the taxpayer has the right to receive the funds. Mm. So even if you tell the escrow or the closing attorney, don't disperse the funds, I'm going to do a 1031 exchange. It doesn't matter, it's too late, it's taxable. There's no way to go back and fix that. So you have to be very careful, get it set up prior to. Mm. And then the closing is actually what triggers the 45 days and the 180 days. So you have. The 45 days you mentioned to identify what you're going to acquire, you have an additional 135 days after that to complete your exchange for a total of 180 days. Um, in the second of the three tests for um, identifying like kind replacement property, the identify any number of candidates so long as the total combined fair market value does not exceed 2x the sale price of the property you're relinquishing. Uh, I just want to understand since the sale, the closing of the relinquished property may not occur until like the future, even past the 45 day mark. Um, if, the, uh, if the investor is trying to satisfy the second test, like that's the way they're going to do it, then do they just bear the risk that the final sale price may be higher or lower and may actually uh, there's a risk that it may actually they may actually run afoul of the second um, the second test. Does that make sense? Because you can't be sure that it's going to be two x until you know the final sale price. That's true, and, and especially in this market, that's a huge risk because it could end up being a, a lot more than two hundred percent with all of the bidding wars and and you know above asking prices that we're seeing out there. So we always advise you know don't go right up to the exact two hundred percent mark, but usually people will identify the. Uh, listing price, or if they have an idea of what they think the fair market value would be or what they'll end up paying for it or their top price, something like that, um, they really should work with their advisors and put it all together and determine what, what they think is appropriate and what is defensible if it's under an audit. Got it. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, double click a little bit on, uh, I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit about this already, but wanted to double click to see if there's more detail that's worth fleshing out. Like what makes a property like kind for 1031 eligibility purposes? Are there criteria? Uh, there are criteria and it goes back to the qualified use requirements. So as long as it's rental investment or business use, uh, to, to flesh that out a little more, the, the rental means you've rented or leased the property to somebody or somehow it's producing income, whatever that means. Um, and that would qualify for, for 1031 exchange purposes. Uh, I classify the second area as held for investment because you could buy uh, real estate, whether it be any type of uh, real estate with a, a dwelling on it, it could be vacant land, whatever it might be. You could buy real estate and hold it for appreciation and not rent it or lease it out. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to produce cash flow, but it does have to be held for investment purposes. And the third category is business use. So if you buy any type of real estate and you run or operate your business out of it, uh, that would also qualify. So it has to be something along those lines where your intent 
uh, is to buy and hold for rental investment or business use. And the investment, that would be true even for if it's like purely speculative, is that correct? Yes. I mean, if you certainly, you know, you think, okay, the development for this particular area is going this direction. Let's buy a bunch of land in that direction and hold it for capital appreciation. And then we intend to sell when it hits a certain price point. That's held for investment. That will certainly qualify. Uh, if they buy specifically for, you know, to build as a developer and then sell, then it would not qualify. Uh, you get into the risky area where you buy land, you're holding for appreciation. And then what if you subdivide at the very last minute, sell and do an exchange? Did your intent mm. change? Mm. Um, and that's the critical area. So some people will take the position, no, I, I have no intention of developing. I'm not going to do that, but I can maximize my value by subdividing. But just keep in mind, if you get audited, that's the risk. They, they may come in and try to allege that you are really holding for development and then decided to sell instead of finishing it. So there's some risks if you look like you're developing or rehabbing. Interesting. Um, so on, on that point, to satisfy the intent requirement, do you have to, I guess, you, is it true then that you have to show that you had the intent for uh, rental investment or business use both on the way in and the way out? Like what if that intended change? Yes, absolutely. So both on the relinquished property and the replacement property would have to demonstrate that intent. Uh, oh, I meant, sorry, I meant, I meant like on the relinquished property, when you acquired it and when you sold it, you have to show that at, do you have to show that at both points? There was oh, that intent? I, yes. So the intent is critical all the way through, both in and out. Uh, intent can change. For example, probably the most common uh, example for intent to change would be Someone sells, does a 1031 exchange, uh, buys a, a single family residential property, rents it for say two years, mm -hmm. which straddles three tax returns. So that's really solid proof. That was the intent. And then at that point, they, they think, you know, I, I'm going to change my intent. I'm going to move into it and convert it to my primary residence. So as long as their intent uh, for the first couple of years is truly to hold for rental purposes, that will qualify. And then intent can change later. Uh, if they can show under audit that their intent was always to live there, then they've got a problem. I see. And then if I do want to actually circle back to that scenario uh, in a bit, but in that, uh, just to um, expand upon that, if the intent did change, they convert into primary residence, then when they sell that property, if it's still their primary residence, they can no longer use that as a 1031, even though they started out with the intent to use it as a rental property. Is that correct? Yeah, good point. Yes, because the intent has changed. Now it's held for personal use. Uh, it's no longer held as rental property. That's a good point. Yep. And I, and I assume the same would be true if they started out as a primary residence, then later moved out to convert it to a rental. Uh, as long as the intent existed at the time that they were going to relinquish that property, they could avail a 1031? Yes. And that actually, that scenario, that structure has a couple potential planning opportunities. So let's say they buy a house. It's their primary residence. You know, who knows? Let's just say it's more than two years, whatever that is. Uh, actually, let me use an exact client or a specific client as an example. So we had a couple, husband and wife, uh, bought property in La Jolla, California, lived in it for 42 years as their primary residence. Um, they were having health issues, wanted to go back east with their kids and grandkids, um, but their capital gain was $8 million. So if they had sold, they would have gotten $500,000 tax-free as the 121 exclusion, but they would have gotten killed on taxes for $7.5 million. Uh, there's actually an IRS ruling they, they put out where you can move out of the house, convert it to investment property. And then when you, so I would say you rent it for probably two years, which straddles three tax returns, uh, really solid proof that was your intent to hold for rental purposes. And then you've got one more year to sell and close on the sale. And at that point, you still qualify for two out of the last five years. So you can still get mm. the $500,000 tax-free exclusion and you've rented it for two years. So now you qualify for a 1031 exchange. So in their case, they got 500,000 tax free and seven and a half million deferred through a 1031 exchange. Oh, interesting. So in that case, you would, I guess, want to just structure it so that like almost exactly $500,000 is recognized as gain because that's tax free and all the rest of it gets rolled into the next transaction. Exactly. Yep. And we can actually structure our documents where we assign into the escrow for everything except for 500,000. And that way, the 500000 is automatically taxable, but then you get the exemption so you don't pay tax. Oh, that's brilliant. So okay, got it. The key there is when they move out and start that process, the day they move out, they got a three-year window to do all of that. And if you miss the three-year window, you lose your 500000 tax-free exclusion. 
but you would still qualify for a 1031 exchange. Right, right. Got it. Okay. Um, can you exchange a domestic U.S. property for foreign property or vice versa? Good question. No. Uh, you used to be able to, God, I think like in 88, 89 or so back then, uh, then the U.S. Uh, Congress got wise to the fact that people were selling U.S. properties, exchanging into country properties in countries that had no tax treaty, so it became a tax-free exchange. Uh, so they they put the kibosh on that. Now you can, uh, contrary to what you read on the internet and brochures, you can uh, sell foreign property and do a 1031 exchange into other foreign property. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, that boils down to if you are a U.S. citizen. And let's say you own a rental flat in London and you're going to sell that, uh, then you have to calculate, you know, what taxes you pay in London or in the UK. And that is what it is, of course. They don't have a 1031 exchange. Then you calculate what you're going to pay over here in the US, including that foreign tax credit. And if there's still a net tax due, then it makes sense to do the 1031 exchange. And you just have to exchange into some other foreign property that's also held for rental investment or business use. So all of the properties have to be foreign or they all have to be U.S., but you can't go between the two. Got it. If they're both foreign, do they have to be in the same country or can they cross um, countries? And are, are there any restrictions? Like, can it be any pair of countries? Uh, no restrictions whatsoever. As long as it's foreign property, it could be any country. So it doesn't matter. Uh, we've done exchanges now in about 45 different countries. Uh, they're always interesting. Each country's got their own you know, laws and regulations and closing processes and customs. So it's uh, always a challenge. Gotcha. Okay, that's super helpful to know. Um, when it comes to state tax considerations, what happens when you do a 1031 exchange in one state and then purchase a replacement property in another state? Like when you later sell the second property, the replacement one, do you owe state taxes in both states or just in the second state? And how would it even be apportioned? Good question. Uh, it's my favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> so uh, just a couple kind of comments off the top. First of all, the 49 states pretty much follow uh, the 1031 exchange. Pennsylvania does not. So if you're selling rental investment or business use property in Pennsylvania, you can defer the federal taxes, but you'll pay the Pennsylvania state taxes. Mm. I can't remember, but I think the state, the Pennsylvania state tax is like three to three and a half percent, something like that. Uh, California has what people have nicknamed the California clawback provision. So if you sell in California and 1031 exchange out of the state, uh, it is tax deferred. Um, but California has always taken the position that it's deferred, and if you ever sell and cash out and pay the tax in the future, they want their quote-unquote fair share. Uh, but as long as you keep exchanging over and over and over, uh, and then you exchange until you pass on and you get that step up in cost basis that you had mentioned, then California gets nothing. Uh, the only time they would get paid is if you actually decided to stop exchanging, you sold and cashed out and paid the tax. Got it. In that case, how would it be apportioned? Uh, good question. California really calculates the tax based on the gain while it was in California. So they don't tax you on gain that was out of state. Uh, and generally, if you're paying California tax and you're also paying tax in the other state, you get a foreign tax credit. Really, it's a credit for the state tax you paid in the other state on the California return. So you're not paying double tax, but you're paying the higher tax, which is typically California. I see. So there would, in that sense, like if I, um, had property in California exchanged out to property in Texas and then later just for whatever reason sold it. Um, I may owe a uh, tax to California on the portion of the gain that accrued while I was in California or while the property existing in California, but I would never be in a situation it sounds like where I'm paying taxes to both California and Texas on the same dollar of gain. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. If, if Texas did have a state tax, you'd get a credit for whatever tax you paid in Texas on your California return. So you wouldn't be paying double, uh, you'd just be paying the higher tax rate. Now, I okay. think uh, most of the you know, tax, uh, like the tax attorneys and, and tax advisors we speak to, and, and I agree with it, think that that whole California clawback is unconstitutional. Hmm. Um, so I think it's just a matter of when somebody finally steps up to the plate and decides, you know, enough, I'm going to fight that. Hmm. Uh, so I always tell clients, you know, if that's what you want to do, I wouldn't stop and not do it just because of the California clawback. All you have to do is file an extra tax form with your tax return each year uh, that just says, look, I'm still holding the property. It's still tax deferred. That's you know, just one extra tax form. So it's not a huge deal. It's a little pain, but not a huge deal. And at some point in the future, like if you go to, to Texas, like you said, uh, it could become tax free in the future on the state level if they right. finally fight California. Got it. 
why haven't so California has lots of you know rich commercial real estate investors why haven't any of them fought this that's um, a good or, question it's uh Franchise tax board is not fun. Um, and when they sink their teeth into you, they've got unlimited resources, basically, and they're known for fighting that kind of stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it's a matter of time before the tax liability is great enough and they decide to do that. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Could you talk a little bit about the differences between the different types of 1031 exchanges? So forward versus concurrent versus reverse? Sure. Uh, forward exchanges by far is the most popular. That's about 97% of our volume. So forward exchange is where the investor sells their current property or their relinquished property first. And then they have the 45 and 180 days to identify and close on the new replacement property. That's just a lot more streamlined. Um, the, the fees are much less, et cetera. So that's why most people do that. Um, the risk with a forward exchange is you're selling. So you've sold, you've closed, and once you close on that sale, you've triggered your gain. So then it becomes an issue of can you identify and can you acquire the replacement property? And if you can, it's deferred, but if you can't, it's taxable and there's no way to go back and undo that. So that's the risk. And in today's market, that's a big challenge. Uh, the reverse exchange can solve a lot of those risks because you're buying first. So you actually, uh, spend all the time you want to find the right property, make sure it's suitable, go under contract, you can close on the purchase. Uh, the challenge, and it's more complicated and there's more costs involved. Uh, so the first complication is you're buying first, you haven't sold, so your equity is trapped. Uh, if you have cash in your bank account and you can pay all cash for it, then it's great, you can do it. But if you have no cash, which most people are real estate rich, cash poor, uh, it, how do you buy that new property first when you haven't sold anything? So that's the first uh, issue they have to look at and solve for. Second is a, a pure reverse exchange would mean that the taxpayer could go out, acquire the new replacement property, hold title to both, and then sell their current property later. And the IRS doesn't allow that. Uh, so they've set up this parking arrangement where the qualified intermediary has to acquire and hold or what the IRS calls park uh, legal title to one of the two properties. So generally we will acquire and hold or park legal title to the new replacement property. Uh, and then that begins that 180 day window. So we're kind of holding the property on their behalf until they sell their current property. So it's really a parking arrangement up front and then a concurrent 1031 exchange at the back end. So when they sell their current property, they deed it to the buyer and then we transfer the property we're holding for them to them. So it's really a concurrent swap at the back end. It's just, there's, like I said, there's that parking arrangement. If there's a lender involved, the lenders aren't terribly happy with reverse exchanges. Uh, the traditional lenders probably won't touch it. Uh, it might be a hard money or private money lender. Uh, life insurance companies will do it uh, for the most part. Uh, local community banks or regional banks will often look at it. Uh, so it really depends on the borrower's relationship with the institution. I see. And, and what is a, a concurrent uh, 1031 exchange? It sounds like, it, is it where just where title transfers simultaneously in a reverse or? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so everything happens on the same day. So even with a forward exchange, you could sell and close on the purchase of your new property on the same day. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts there. And if something goes wrong, it, it causes all sorts of issues. So concurrent transactions are not that common. Um, it's usually better if you close and then plan a one or two weeks before. So if something goes wrong, if there's a title problem or an escrow problem or something, you have time to fix it uh, before you have to close. If you close concurrently and something blows up, then you've got an issue because the seller is going, wait a minute, come on, let's perform. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about qualified intermediaries. To execute a 1031, you have to go through a qualified intermediary. Can you explain what that is, why QIs exist, what's their job or role, and, and why investors can't legally do a 1031 transactions themselves. Sure, uh, and that goes way back to the 60s. So before, you know, if you go way back, actually I should jump in there real quick and say, this is the 100 year anniversary of 1031 exchanges. So it's been in the tax code now for 100 years this year. Um, and so if you go way back, all the 1031 exchanges were concurrent. They would just swap properties at the exact same time. And then the 60s, a family by the name of Starker up in the Pacific Northwest actually did the first delayed exchange, or at least the first one that the IRS audited and disqualified. So they had basically a five-year delayed exchange. They sold land to Crown Zellerbach Inc. 
And in return, Crown Zellerbach said, we'll put a credit on our accounting records for you equal to the value of your land. Over the next five years, you go buy something or tell us what you want. We'll buy it for you and deed it to you. So it's really a five-year delayed exchange and IRS audited, disqualified everything. Starker family fought and they actually won in tax court. Uh, so that's why we have the today's delayed exchange is because of the Starker family. And so you might hear people still today refer to it as a Starker exchange and that's why. Uh, but with that whole process, you know, it's very clear that the taxpayer is not supposed to have uh, either constructive receipt or actual receipt of the funds. So over time, the industry kind of developed this, you know, first they called them straw men and then facilitators and accommodators. And now we're qualified intermediaries. <laughs> Uh, we're really, it's, those mean all the same thing. We're just a third party that drafts the documents to structure the 1031 exchange. Uh, we hold the cash proceeds between the sale and the ultimate purchase, or we hold the real estate if it's a reverse exchange between the purchase and then the ultimate sale. And then we're really here in an advisory and consultative position where we jump on the phone with the client and all their advisors and kind of walk through all the issues that might come up. Okay, got it. It's very comprehensive. What distinguishes a good QI from a bad one? Ah, that's a good one. Uh, there are, first of all, anybody can set up shop and, and serve uh, as a qualified intermediate. There are no um, barriers to entry. Anybody can open up a shop as a qualified intermediary. That's the scary part because qualified intermediaries hold lots of money for lots of clients. So there's a lot of things you wanna look at. From my perspective, the most important element is some type of government or regulatory oversight. And we recognized that a number of years ago and we went through a two year plus process of uh, going through the regulatory review and approval process to get our trust company charter. So now all of our funds are held by Exeter Trust Company. Uh, that means a number of things. Number one, there's a, a lot of people are familiar with Land America and Land America 1031 Exchange. And they were probably one of the top five title insurance companies in terms of size and scope uh, back in the pre 2008 era. The recession hit and uh, the 1031 exchange company long story but the 1031 exchange company actually took the entire company down because of what they invested the funds in had those funds been regulated or, or subject to government oversight that would have probably been avoided um, so that's the first issue second issue is they ended up in bankruptcy court and bankruptcy court said you're holding these funds in your corporate name therefore they're corporate funds not client funds uh, that was, you know, a shock to the industry. It didn't surprise us because that's the way the contracts are drafted. We always thought that's what they, the court would do. So for those reasons, we thought, you know what, we need to do better. So we need to go out and start a trust company. So the funds are clearly held in a fiduciary trust capacity for the client, not in our corporate capacity. It also gives the clients a separate segregated dual signature qualified trust account. So they're clearly separate from all of their client funds and they're subject to an annual audit by the division of banking. So uh, I think it's very important to have that. You certainly wanna look at bonding and insurance. So fidelity bond and errors and emissions insurance, et cetera. Because we're a financial institution, we all also have the financial institution bond package, uh, but those are the things you wanna look at. And then you always wanna make sure the funds are held in a qualified trust account. And a lot of exchange companies still hold it in their corporate name. Got it. So when you say that, uh, I want to dive into some of those other things that you mentioned before, but just to clarify, when you say that um, uh, when the QI is, is, is regulated and um, uh, also does not, I guess, commingle funds into their corporate account, does that, does the practical implication mean that that money is stored in a trust account? Like that's the way you would accomplish those two things? Yes, absolutely. Okay. The, um, the, the industry standard and practice that started way back when was you just you open separate accounts, either individual bank accounts or one, uh, one omnibus account. It's under the corporate name, so it's held by the corporate entity, but they're kept separate as client funds. The problem is you end up in bankruptcy. Legal title on a signature card just says the name of the qualified intermediary, so they're corporate funds. So by putting them in the qualified trust account, that clearly makes them client or fiduciary funds. I see. And pre... 2008, or maybe even still going on now, but at least in the example you gave, um, uh, for QIs that would not do this um, more regulated holding structure of client funds, they is it that I understand clearly? They would actually invest the the money, like say in short-term securities or even risky securities, because they were trying to get a little bit of extra um, return from that. 
Yes, exactly right. There's been some smaller qualified intermediaries that actually took client funds and invested in real estate and thinking, you know, I'm going to make a lot of money. I know real estate, et cetera. But then a recession hits and all of a sudden the value of that real estate drops and they're, they're caught with their pants down, essentially. And that's when they, you know, when recessions hit, that's when these things kind of come to light. In the Land America case, they invested in auction rate securities. Those are not necessarily bad investments, but they're not prudent for 1031 exchange transactions. And when the auction rate market or the auction securities market froze in February, I think it was February 2008, I believe, um, Land America couldn't pull the cash out. It was still there and they were still good investments. And ultimately they got access to it later. But as long as that financial crisis was in place, they couldn't get the funds out. So it kind of forced them into an involuntary Ponzi scheme. Mm. And then they started putting corporate funds in to cover it when the market got worse and worse and they ran out of corporate funds. And that's what took the whole company down. Wow, okay. Um, I, on your company blog, you write about the criteria that investors should screen for when deciding which QI to work with. And there, there are four risk factors that you pointed out. One, depth of experience and expertise, which um, seems straightforward. Two, employee error, error or omission. Three, employee theft or embezzlement of funds. And four, prior bankruptcy filings uh, by the QI. Can you talk a little bit about each of these in more detail, including what kind of documents or insurance verifications investors should request from the QI before doing business with them? Sure, absolutely. And, and I, those are kind of rank in order of what we think is most important. A lot of people get hung up on Fidelity Bond and E&O insurance, and those are certainly important. But the biggest area we find losses occurring is where a, a qualified intermediary just didn't understand the transaction, uh, didn't have the depth of experience, and they just processed it. And they think they're just a processor. They do what their client tells them, and they try to hang the hat on your tax advisor should review this whole thing. But in reality, the qualified intermediary is supposed to be the expert. So when you don't have that depth of expertise, stuff happens. Um, for example, there's one case in Colorado where they sold as individuals, they bought as a corporation. That is clearly completely different taxpayers. It will not qualify, but the qualified intermediary process is like that. So of course they got sued and, and lost. So you need a qualified intermediary that really understands what the transaction is all about and all the intricacies uh, involved in administering the transaction. So that's part of the danger. There's people who just open up shop and they've been in business a year or two and they haven't made all their mistakes yet. Um, so for those, you just wanna look at depth of experience. And with that, it's really you know calling and talking to them, asking a ton of questions and see what you feel. And if you talk to three or four or five qualified intermediaries, you're gonna figure out pretty quickly who knows their, their business and who doesn't. Um, the next one is, is different types of you know, fidelity bond, errors and emissions, insurance, et cetera. And that's easy. Uh, just verify what they've got. Ask them for copies of their certificate or evidence of insurance. And you can even call the insurance agent and verify that it does in fact exist. So that would be critical as, as well. Uh, what are, are there, um, I guess, coverage amounts that you recommend uh, investors see in you know, documents to ensure that, um, you know, should anything happen that uh, there's adequate insurance to cover any um, loss of funds? Yes, good question. Um, and there's certainly a huge range of coverage out there. I mean, you've got a few, one or two, three, maybe that have like a hundred million. Um, if you look at that and you read the policy, it's not per occurrence, it's in aggregate. Uh, so those are generally the very large title insurance companies, but it's in aggregate. So if they have some major losses, three or four or five major losses in the same year, you may not be covered. So it sounds great, but if it depends on the year and it depends on how many aggregate losses they have. Uh, then you get a lot of the smaller qualified intermediaries and they either have no bonding or very small, maybe 100,000 or 250,000. Well, most transactions are, are greater than that in size. Um, so you want to kind of look at that and balance it out. Um, we we decided at this point, because underwriters are difficult to work with today, uh, after the 08 recession, they're hesitant to underwrite qualified intermediaries. So most transactions are under $5 million. So we got $5 million in fidelity and E&O coverage and it's per occurrence. Uh, and then we also have the dual signature qualified trust account. So money can't be moved without the client's actual signature. So with all of that, we've kind of balanced the insurance plus the control that the client has. Got it. Okay. So... If the money is held in a trust account, dual signature, as you said, so can't be moved, that would seem to neutralize the risk of um, 
bankruptcy impacting those funds, I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, it would seem to also neutralize the risk of employee theft or embezzlement because of the dual signature requirement. Are those two things correct, first of all? Yeah, that's absolutely right. In our case, it requires at least four people within the company to get involved to move money. So two from the administration side, one to request it, one to sign off on it. Then it goes to the trust operations area and it requires one person to process it, another person to release it and approve it. So there's four people involved there. And it also includes at least one signature from the client side in order to get any of those funds released. And what is er employee error, error or omission? What does that even mean? Uh, that's where uh, the qualified intermediary makes a mistake. So whether they omit something or they make a mistake or somehow uh, to be blunt, screw up the documentation, screw up the transaction, it triggers a loss for the client, then we can file a claim under the E&O insurance coverage for either error or omission that caused the loss. I got Fidelity, it. Okay. Fidelity bond is really kind of the crime insurance, so it's theft, misappropriation <laughs> funds, embezzlement, et cetera. Okay, got it. So if there's adequate um, you know, fidelity bond insurance and there is adequate um, error and omission insurance, are there any other ways that funds might be lost or, or, or is it basically bulletproof after that? Uh, well, uh, of course, nothing is ever bulletproof. There's always somebody smarter out there and that's, the, that's what you're always trying to plan for. Uh, the other area is, is the financial institution, the bank where the funds are actually held at. Uh, so in our case, because we're a trust company, we can spread the funds across a number of banks. Uh, so we currently spread across eight different banks. And that means we can spread it across eight banks. So the FDIC insurance is 250,000 times eight. So everyone gets $2 million in FDIC insurance. That's what a lot of qualified intermediaries can't do because they're not trust companies. I see. Got it. Okay. Um, how far in advance of um, closing a 1031 tr transaction, do you recommend investors first um, engage a 1031 administrator? Like, well, what is the lead time that investors should prepare for uh, in working with a, a qualified intermedi intermediary to hit the deadlines they intend to hit? Good question. You know, uh, that kind of bounces all over depending on the company you're working with and what have you. So I've seen some companies that say they need at least a week before they can do anything or, you know, lead time. Um, if it's a reverse exchange, some say two weeks or three weeks. Um, some can do immediate turnaround. So it depends on the company you're working with. In our case, uh, we offer same day service. Um, so we can get things turned around very quickly. The, the last minute rushes though are tough because you, you just don't know how many you're gonna get in one day. And if it's closer to the end of the month and we get you know, 10 or 15 rushes all of a sudden at the same hour, uh, it's pretty tough to get that knocked out in time for closing the same day or the next day. So I would say once you go under contract and all the buyer's contingencies have been signed off on, so you're pretty sure it's a solid deal, that's probably the perfect time to contact us and get the 1031 exchange open. And that's probably one week into the transaction, into the closing process. You probably got two, three, four weeks before you actually close. So it's plenty of time for us to review documents, catch any errors that might, we might find in the documents and fix things. If it's a last minute, we're closing today or we're closing tomorrow, we don't have a whole lot of time to review stuff. So we may miss something because we just have to get it done so you can close. Got it. Um, how do qualified intermediaries make money? Like, is it a flat fee, percent of transaction? And what's the fee range just for the QI that the property owner should expect to spend to do a 1031 exchange? On the, the forward exchange side, uh, it, it, it varies across the country. So on the West Coast, you tend to see more like $700, $750 on the low side to maybe a thousand, 1100, maybe even 1200 on the high side. Uh, for a forward exchange for one sale, one purchase, we're at 899. So we're kind of right in the middle of the range. Um, that should include everything. It, it should include the, you know, the process, the documentation, the consulting, uh, all the transactions, uh, the wire transfer fee. We don't charge anything extra, just a flat fee of $899. Uh, some people charge wire transfer fees or transaction costs. Uh, so you gotta look at that and see the big picture. Are you comparing apples to apples? The further you get to the East Coast, uh, you're gonna see some that are like 1200 to maybe 1800 or even more. I think that's because there's less competition on the East Coast. Uh, you get more qualified intermediaries that are attorneys, so they typically charge more. Um, but the on a national level, the national qualified intermediaries or institutional qualified intermediaries like us 
typically you're going to see 7750 to maybe at the high side 1200 that should include one sale one purchase there's usually additional fees so if you sell more than one or you buy more than one uh, it can be anywhere from like 300 to maybe 500 dollars extra per closing mm -hmm. uh, and then the the third area which really isn't a fee per se but the qualified intermediary uh, retains some of the interest. The bank actually pays the qualified intermediary interest. And so that's kind of the other area they make money. In today's world, the interest rates are so small, it doesn't do a whole lot of good, but uh, that is part of how they make money. Got it. So it, is, so it sounds like it's basically flat fee. And is that, is that true regardless of the size of the transaction? Like you're selling a, rent, a single family rental property versus you're selling a, you know, an office building in downtown Manhattan? Uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty much a flat fee until you hit maybe 10 million. When it goes over 10 million, then we look at the transaction, evaluate it for risk, uh, see what's involved. There's usually more consulting involved. Um, obviously, we're doing a transaction with a much greater dollar value, so there's greater risk. So for that, we'll usually charge more. Um, if it's a concurrent transaction, so we don't hold the funds at all, uh, then we're not getting any interest. So maybe an additional fee there because we're not getting revenue on the, on the bank side. <laughs> Got it. And what about reverse transactions? Since those reverses, are a lot more uh, boy, reverses are all across the, the field. Um, I've seen some that are down, like in the give or take about three thousand dollar range. Be very careful with those. Um, you know, with a reverse exchange, you know, there's a parking arrangement. The qualified intermediary has to hold title to the property. They have to do certain things with that property. Uh, so one is they have to report it on their financial statements as property acquired and held for sale. They have to report it on their tax return as acquired and held for sale. Uh, there's things like that behind the scenes. And some of the qualified intermediaries that charge a very low fee uh, aren't doing that. And under audit, they'll be your, your transaction will be disqualified. And then next, because you're, we're holding title to the property, we always use a completely separate brand new LLC just for that client's transaction. We never reuse that. A lot of the exchange companies with those lower fees reuse the same entity over and over and over. It's just a matter of time before some kind of lien or judgment attaches to the entity and attaches to all the properties involved. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that from the exchange transaction perspective, the parking arrangement transaction, the separate LLC just for that transaction, all the consulting. And the big one is we're holding title to the property. So it's liability. Most of the reverse exchange fees for exchange companies that really know what they're doing, you're looking at like 5,500 to maybe 9,500-ish. That's probably a good range. Uh, we're at 6,850. Got it. Okay, cool. That's helpful kind of mental model for folks uh, thinking about pricing. Okay, um, we, we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier, but I, I wanted to drill on a couple of um, follow-ups regarding the changing the use of the property. Like if you move out, of your primary residence converted into a rental. <clears throat> we talked about the example of your client who had lived there for 42 years. Uh, you can do a 1031. I just wanted to um, confirm, it's, even then it sounds like there's no um, uh, safe harbor uh, duration holding requirement, right? It's just based on intent. So in theory, you could do this and show it uh, even if you held for, uh, it for investment or rental for a very short period of time. Have I got that right? Absolutely. Uh, and a perfect example is uh, a client that we talked to just a few months ago, where he did an exchange, bought his replacement property, and just a few months into the transaction, uh, because of COVID-19, he lost his job, etc. Uh, he, he was starting to lose property. So he sold off some properties and had to move into his rental property just to survive financially. So that will qualify because it was a 1031 exchange. He had the intent to hold it for rental. But there was a purpose, a, a, a fun, in this case, kind of a medical economic uh, catastrophe, if you will, that kind of hit him and it is what it is. So if you can show you had the intent, but something happened, there was a business reason, an economic reason, et cetera, it'll work. So pandemic is certainly a, a good way to get around some of those things. And the kind of documentation you would want to show if you were audited would be like things like uh, emails. Um, uh, are there any other kind of... Um, important documents you would recommend folks uh, make sure that they uh, just ha keep a paper trail on? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, historically it used to be, or it still is, but it was more important to do things like tax returns, uh, financial statements, loan applications. You'd report the properties as held for investment, held for rental, what have you, on those documents. Mm -hmm. uh, today's, they certainly help, but today's world emails and emails can help you or they can hurt you. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if they find the smoking gun in the email, you're probably in trouble. So be careful what you put in the emails. Uh, but emails between you know your advisors, your tax, your legal, your realtor, your escrow, uh, et cetera, and us as the qualified intermediary, all of those emails can help demonstrate what your intent was. Okay. And the opposite scenario, um, uh, where you know you you have you acquire an investment property through a 1031 exchange, but then some years later, for example, you subsequently move into that property as a primary resident uh, residence. What are the tax considerations that uh, real estate investors should should keep in mind? You know, at that point, uh, you've done a, ta a tax deferred exchange. It's tax deferred. Uh, and then all you're doing is changing your intent. So you're converting it to your primary residence. So the conversion and you moving into the property does not trigger any tax consequences because you haven't sold anything. Mm. So you would really just stop reporting it as a rental property uh, on Schedule E and you would begin to report it as your primary residence, but that's really all that's involved. Uh, and then somewhere down the road, if you sell it, then you've got a whole different tax code. That's gonna fall under section 121 of the tax code. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the 250 or $500,000 tax rate exclusion. Now, if it was investment property first and then you converted it to a primary residence, you may not, it probably won't get the full 250 or 500 because the gain is prorated between the number of years you uh, rented it and held it as rental property versus the number of years you lived in it. So the longer you live in it, the more gain becomes tax-free. I see. Um, I see. And, and so that proration, I guess, um, is, it, is it correct that um, if you moved in as a primary residence, so long as you lived there for two years, um, you'll get some, some exclusion under Section 121? Yes. So for example, if you bought it, rented it for two years, and then lived in it for two years, it's 50-50, 50% would be tax-free. If you rented it for 10 years, moved in it for two years, then you know, 10 twelfths is going to be taxable. Two twelfths would be uh, tax-free. Okay. Um, sounds good. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some broader strategy points for doing these transactions. Is it ever tax advantageous to do a cash out refi before doing a 1031? And for sake of argument, let's assume you do that refi sufficiently far in advance of the 1031 that it won't be challenged by the IRS as being done in, in anticipation of. Um, what are the circumstances, what are the um, conditions that would have to be true for that to be tax advantageous? Good question. Of course, the risk there is if you refinance prior to under audit, the IRS would say you really didn't intend to reinvest the equity. Uh, but you hit the nail on the head, which is if you do it well enough in advance, uh, then it won't look like you intended to cash out. So I usually recommend at least six months or more before you you know cash out, do a cash out refi before you actually sell and do an exchange. Generally, advisors recommend that it's safer if you do the exchange and then you do a cash out refinance after you acquire your replacement property, then you probably just need to wait uh, you know, two or three months to do the cash out refi. Um, but your question is, would it make sense to do it beforehand? And there are certain scenarios, you know, if you are um, going into a net lease property, if you're going into a Delaware statutory trust, things like that, uh, with a Delaware statutory trust, you can't refinance and cash out. Uh, with a net lease property, it may be very difficult to do that or, or cost prohibitive. So there are ways we go, you know, what I want to do, my strategies won't make sense. So I have to do the refi, cash out refi in advance. In that case, just do it well in advance before you sell and do an exchange. If you do it in advance versus after uh, the 1031 closes, the economic effect, assuming you had the flexibility to do either, the economic effect should be the same, right? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so one thing I'm trying to get my head around is it can be hard to acquire the right property at the right time because it depends on a suitable replacement property even being available, a smooth negotiation and closing process to acquire that property. And the same is true for the selling of the relinquished property. You need a motivated buyer who can meet your price expectations. You need a smooth closing process. And when you're doing a 1031, you have to manage like both of these processes in parallel. So they both land at the same or at the right time relative to each other. What, what strategies or advice do you have for investors to maximize the chance that both of those processes go smoothly? Like, should they shop for the replacement property first? Should you write offers with a 1031 contingency attached? Like, what are the best practices for making sure you comply with all the deadlines and requirements and minimizing the chance of things going awry? Good, excellent question, actually, and especially in today's market. So the, the key with a 1031 exchange is planning, you know, 
plan everything out, know exactly what you want to do. Obviously, stuff goes wrong, but have your ducks in a row, uh, have your plan ready to go. Uh, that way, you kind of know what you're doing. And then when something catches you off guard, you can quickly you know, maneuver and address the issue. Uh, in today's market, you're getting you know, multiple offers, bidding wars, you're getting prices in excess of your asking price, et cetera. So it's still very much a seller's market. So on the sales side, you can probably list, sell your property, tell the buyers, I'm in the middle or I'm trying to do a 1031 exchange. I need you to cooperate with me. And there's enough buyers where, you know, you may give up a little bit of the sale price, but you'll probably find a buyer who's willing to cooperate and give you a long-term closing or options to extend or something like that. As long as you don't close the escrow, close the sale transaction, you haven't triggered your deadline. So you're okay there. Uh, on the buy side, it gets a little more challenging because it's still a seller's market. So the sellers probably aren't going to cooperate a whole lot. But as you're going through the process, I would start looking right away. If you find property you like, see if the seller is willing to cooperate. Sometimes they will. Uh, maybe you could say, look, can I lease your property, pay you a rent every month for whatever with an option to buy? Um, if you need, need assurance, can I go under contract and have a long-term closing? Can I have options to extend? Worst case, they can say is no, but you know, obviously they're getting multiple offers probably too. So depending on what you put in your offer, they may not even consider it. But those are ideas you can look at. This is a tough market because it's uh, on the sales side, you've got control, but on the sale or the buy side, you're not the seller, you don't have control. Uh, so really the focus is probably on the sales side, see if you can get a buyer who can really cooperate with you. Right. And if the, I'm just curious, like, you know, if, for the property that you're looking to purchase as a replacement property, if the seller knows that you're doing a 1031 exchange, does that give them, does that not give them a lot of leverage over you since the exchange deadlines are non-negotiable, can't be altered for any reason? Like if a seller drags their feet or they're unscrupulous or they, they try to take advantage of the situation somehow and then the transaction falls through for whatever reason, you could get screwed. Is that something that 1031 clients need to worry about or is that not a thing? And if it is something they need to worry about, how, how can they mitigate that risk? I think that's a really good point. Uh, it, it doesn't happen a lot because by, by and by, most people are good people, but there are people out there who are not. And I have seen it happen. Uh, so there's no magic answer to that question. It kind of depends on the investor, their agents. And as you're going through the process, use your gut instinct. You know, as the seller or the, if the seller of your replacement property is a good person or not. Um, you don't have to disclose that you're doing a 1031 exchange up front from a 1031 exchange perspective. I uh, know there are local laws, customs, and what have you, and state uh, forms that require you to do that. But from a 1031 exchange perspective, you don't have to disclose up front. Uh, and you're absolutely right. If the seller finds out that you, let's say you've only identified that seller's property and you're past the 45 day period, so they know you can't change your mind, they could come back and try to reprice the property and up at 50 or 100,000 or whatever, just because they know they can, and you're kind of stuck. So you, you kind of just have to keep your eyes wide open and figure out what's best for you and your transaction. But that is a, that is a concern. Okay. Um, are there any common dumb mistakes that investors make that disqualify them from a 1031? Uh, you know, the most common are not not doing their homework and not paying attention to the deadlines. Um, you know, you could it's the old adage, you can take the lead a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. So you got to do your own homework. You got to have your plan in place. You got to understand what your 1031 exchange is all about. And it's amazing how people just totally forget about the 45 day. We, we remind them at least three different times and they still forget about the identification period uh, or they forget about the 180 day deadline or things like that. Um, and they, they, you know, a lot of people don't get their tax advisor involved and don't get their legal advisor involved and then stuff goes wrong. So, you know, to spend a couple hundred bucks uh, for your, your CPA to review the transaction is so worth it. In some cases, it may not be worth doing a 1031 exchange. You may have other loss carry forwards or something else that would offset the gain. So it wouldn't make sense to do that. So it's always better to spend you know, an hour or two hours with your CPA and or legal advisor before you do this. Otherwise you end up getting yourself in trouble. And there are specialists, I, I assume, who do who, like CPAs and lawyers who specifically uh, can very efficiently review 1031 documentation and identify, you know, any problematic issues. That's a good point. You know, a lot of CPAs don't specialize in real estate. They each have their own niche. So you want to look for a CPA who really has a strong niche in real estate. 
Uh, and just by interviewing them and asking them open-ended questions, you can probably figure out if they know their real estate uh, stuff or not. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, wrap by talking a little bit about the Biden administration proposed changes. So part of the uh, administration's economic legislative plan proposes to eliminate tax deferral for 1031 exchanges on real property gains that exceed $500,000. And there's also a related proposal to eliminate the step up in basis at death for investment gains as well. Uh, and these two proposals taken together would essentially gut 1031 exchanges and would have a profound impact to estate planning. What do you think the likelihood is of this type of legislation pass, passing? Like, are your clients worried about it? That's a good question. We're sort of getting a, a ton of phone calls on it. And I think um, one of the reasons that the 1031 exchange volume has exploded since last August is partially because of this. There's certainly a lot of other issues too, you know, the pent up demand for COVID and all the cash that's built up and the stimulus and the PPP loans and uh, all of those phenomenally low interest rates, et cetera. But there's a fear that what if 1031s go away? So we're seeing a lot of people who are trying to reposition today in case it does. Uh, what I can say is I've been doing this for 37 years. Uh, this comes up every three to five years. Uh, almost every Congress and almost every administration has proposed something. And what happens is they, they think that if you change, alter, or eliminate 1031 exchanges, that all the investors would still sell and then pay all the tax. And in reality, what happens is 60, maybe 70% of the investors say, I just wouldn't sell. If I can't defer my taxes and trade up into a bigger property, I just won't sell. And then you have two agents, two accountants, two attorneys, two title companies, two escrow, two lenders, et cetera, that don't get revenue and they don't pay tax. And so rather than a revenue raiser, it turns out to be a revenue loser for the government. And, and then you get people who are trying to make this a democratic thing or a Republican thing, and it's not. Every Congress, every administration has tried this or tried something. So it's more of an educational thing where you have to sit down with, with Congress, you have to sit down with the administration and really walk them through what is a 1031 exchange, what are the benefits, and what would happen if you did this. And uh, the last threat was about five years ago. Uh, the industry trade groups, about 16 different trade groups, formed a coalition. They hired Ernest & Young. And Ernest & Young came back and said if 1031 exchanges went away, GDP would drop by 0.8%. Now, GDP is the measure of the U.S. economy, and back then the GDP was about 1.92% or so. So that's about a 40-45% drop in the national economy just by eliminating 1031 exchanges because of all the parties that it touches uh, with each transaction. Uh, so it's a huge issue. Uh, in this case, um, uh, uh, the Biden campaign proposed a little different, which was if they made over 400,000, you couldn't do a 1031. If you made less than 400, you could. They've now changed it. Uh, so the American um, Families Plan came out last week and said, well, if you have more than $500,000 in gain, it can't be deferred. If you read it, it says, actually I'll quote it, it says the president would also end the special real estate tax break that allows real estate investors to defer taxation when they exchange property for gains greater than $500,000. So my question is, does that mean if you have more than 500,000, you can still 1031 exchange, but only the first 500,000 can be tax deferred? Does that mean that if your gain is over 500,000, you can't do a 1031 exchange? Mm -hmm. now, I've seen opinions on both sides of that. So I'm not sure exactly what it means. Um, I guess we'll have to wait till we get more details out there. But uh, as to you know how likely uh, in 37 years, we managed to fight off all of the changes that would affect real estate, but it's always possible. Got it. And you mentioned that um, there's some evidence or, or um, um, I guess, studies to show, suggest that two thirds of investors just wouldn't sell. But if they're doing that in, in anticipation of just holding it until death so they can get a full step up and basis, but the Biden plan proposes to eliminate that as well, maybe the chance is very low. But were both of those things to pass, would you expect there to be a drastic change in behavior and activity in the market as a result? Uh, I think there would certainly be a decline in 1031 exchange business or, or transaction activity. I don't know if it would be drastic because you've got a number of different issues moving there. Um, you know, at the same time, he's also proposing that if you make more than a million dollars per year, your capital gain rate goes to 39.6%. 
So you've got people who are going to say, I am not going to pay 39.6%. So they may still try to do a 1031 exchange if they can defer some of their some of their gain. Um, so you've got that working there. And then I think most people would realize that he takes away the step up in cost basis. It can be put back. Hmm. So it's hard to say what would happen. And obviously every administration makes changes. So it would, it, I think it would reduce the, the level of activity. The question is how much, and I'm not sure it would be drastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the definition of what I just read depends. If it eliminates them for anything, you just can't do it. That would be a, probably a drastic reduction. If you can defer the first 500,000, it's probably a reduction, but not necessarily drastic. Okay. Um, what are th is there anything that real estate investors can do strategically, potentially even now, to mitigate risk or perceived risk of adverse tax consequences that might result that might result from these proposals? Uh, certainly, that's uh, one of the reasons we're seeing the huge volume. People are trying to reposition their properties today and take advantage of the 1031 exchange just in case that it does go away or, or gets limited somehow. Um, you know, this this plan is just the beginning. It's not even submitted in a bill or legislative format. It's just the, his plan. Uh, so now it has to be uh, goes into negotiations and and it's going to change. There's going to be a lot of changes in this plan. Uh, if everything were to pass, the economy would be in deep, deep trouble. So this is just his wish list. And then from there, we'll see what happens. Um, but I think if if, uh, if you're worried about the step up in cost basis, if you're worried about the 1031 going away, I think you reposition today to make sure you can do it on a tax deferred basis before it, any changes might occur. Yeah. How, um, how long would it take for something like this to play out in the legislative process? Normally, you would say it, it would take a little while. In this case, uh, with the Democrats in control of the House, the White House and the House and the Senate, for the most part, um, it could go through. They're going to have to run this through uh, with a budget reconciliation process. And I'm not sure that, you know, they did that the first stimulus package with that. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to get this one through with, with a, a budget reconciliation process. So th there's even some Democrats that have come out and they're shaking their heads thinking, what is he thinking? So you know, uh, with that, I think you're going to have to make sure all of the Democrats vote for it. And I'm not sure that's possible. And, you know, there's more Democrat millionaires in Congress than there are Republican millionaires. So these guys do 1031 exchanges also, and they want the step up in cost basis also. Um, so that affects them as well. Okay. All right. Um, well, this has been uh, insanely helpful um, and uh, super insightful. Uh, really glad to have chatted with you. Where can people find out more about you and your work and services? Sure, they can uh, call me direct if they want to do that. Uh, my uh, office number here in San Diego, which is our headquarters, is area code 619-239-3091. Again, that's 619-239-3091. Uh, they can go to our website, exeterco.com. So that's E-X-E-T-E-R-C-O.com. Uh, and if they want to uh, try to weigh in on their opinions on the proposed changes, they can go to uh, 1031taxreform.com. That's 1031taxreform.com. Uh, there's all sorts of sample and form letters and what have you. Uh, it's important to let them know what your opinion is. Um, I get a lot of people who say, well, I'm just me, who cares? And they're not gonna read all these letters. You're absolutely right. They don't read all these letters, but what they do is they tally them up to all the no's and all the yeses. And if they get a ton of no's, that tells them the constituents are not in favor of this. So I highly recommend going to uh, 1031taxreform.com and let them know what your opinion is. All right. Thanks, Bill. We'll uh, definitely link to all that stuff in the show notes. Thanks so, so much again for um, sharing your uh, thoughts and, and tips uh, with us today and um, look forward to sharing this with our audience. My pleasure. Anytime. Cheers. Take care. Take care.